So you have hundreds of people that are involved in building and testing and calibrating all these different instruments. And then when they actually get all integrated onto the rover and then that rover goes to Mars, you have all those separate teams that are still working on those instruments because JPL is driving the rover, but all the people that built those original instruments are operating them from all these separate places. Um, Tanya, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming onto our channel. We really appreciate it. Um, if you could maybe just start off with sort of who you are and, and what you do. I know, but like, hello everybody else. Sure thing. So I'm Dr. Tanya Harrison. I'm a planetary scientist. So right now I work at an Earth observing company called Planet Labs as their director of strategic science initiatives. But most people will probably know me for my background before that working in um, Mars mission operations and science on lots of different NASA missions like Opportunity, um, Curiosity, Perseverance, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So I'm actually a, a Mars geology expert before making the return to Earth for my current job. Awesome. Super for super fun. Um, can you tell me a little bit of sort of how you got or when you knew that like science was the thing for you and when you knew that like Mars was the thing for you? So I've been obsessed with space pretty much my whole life. So it's been a very singular focus. Um, when I was about four or five years old, uh, I, I was obsessed with things like Star Trek. Uh, the Next Generation started when I was pretty young. Um, I was really into the book, The Magic School Bus Lost in the Solar System. We had all the Magic School Bus books, but like that one in particular, I loved. And then uh, there was a film called Big Bird in Japan where Big Bird from Sesame Street the, the film itself really doesn't have anything to do with space, but he meets Kaguya Heime, who is the mythological moon princess um, in Japanese mythology. And for some reason after that, I started going outside every night and I'd stare at the moon and um, just like look at the sky. So I was obsessed with space at that point. And my grandfather would give me lots of issues of like Sky and Telescope magazine and National Geographic and stuff that he just had laying around. And then it wasn't until the Pathfinder mission landed on Mars in 1997 that my focus really, really honed in on Mars. I thought it was amazing that we had the ability to drive this little tiny rover on another planet. It was actually the first rover. It, it blows my mind. That was the first rover that we ever sent to another planet uh, and it worked. Um, so that was pretty amazing. I guess it was the first one that didn't crash. So I think the Russians tried to land a couple that like didn't make it, but uh, I, I, I know some folks will call me out if I say we didn't try to send any of the rovers. It's the first one that I drove. <laughs> um, so that was cool. Uh, and after that, I was like, oh my God, I, I want to work on Mars rovers. And so I I set out a goal at that point at the age of like 11. I was like, I'm going to work on Mars rovers. And basically 10 years later, I was doing it. So um, it was it was a very successful, very focused goal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like like Mars rovers are like these amazing pieces of engineering and like like how many pieces are there to put into a Mars rover like just in terms of an engineering perspective like what is it what is it how many how many yeah how many like can you can you tell us a bit about like rovers sure so i i think they're probably even more complicated than people imagine some people maybe are familiar with the jet propulsion laboratory jpl in southern california which builds a lot of or at this point, all of NASA's Mars rovers. But when you hear that, they don't actually build the whole rover. They build like the chassis and the sh suspension system. So like the wheels and mobility and things like that. And that right there is complicated enough, like trying to drive a remote controlled vehicle on a planet that's hundreds of hundreds of thousands of kilometers away. Um, but you also have all the different instruments on board. So things like cameras and spectrometers and uh, weather analyzing instruments, radiation equipment, stuff like that. All of that is built by different universities and different labs and different companies around the world. And they all get operated separately by different groups of people. So you have hundreds of people that are involved in building and testing and calibrating all these different instruments. And then when they actually get all integrated onto the rover and then that rover goes to Mars, you have all those separate teams that are still working on those instruments because JPL is driving the rover, but all the people that built those original instruments are operating them from all these separate places. So it's quite a team effort across not just the United States, but some of these instruments are operated out of Russia 
out of France, out of Canada. So it's a it's a really multinational effort when it comes to these missions. Amazing, amazing. Do they make them look cute on purpose? <laughs> I I don't think it's on purpose, but I think it helps because it's easy to anthropomorphize these adorable little robots compared to something like a satellite where I think people are just not quite as excited about them. Like I think people could name at least one Mars rover if you just ask someone on the street. But if you asked, can you name any of the satellites that are currently orbiting Mars right now? Since none of them have cool names like the old missions like Viking and Mariner, I don't think anybody could actually name any of them. Um, I love the way that you sort of like emphasize the fact that like it's amazing that we've sent something onto another planet because I think that like that's the wonder in in science that and in space that I think even this project is kind of trying to trying to do in terms of like space communication like like how do you think like we're communicating currently about space and how do you think we could be communicating about space? Um, I think that we try to connect with people through awe and curiosity and wonder because a lot of stuff in space is this really grand, you know, where did we come from? Look at this amazingly beautiful nebula. Look at this galaxy that is so far away that there's no chance that at at any point we'll ever make contact with anybody living there or will ever be able to go there as humans. Um, So trying to play on that, I think, really connects with a lot of people because I think we are all really curious to answer those questions of, you know, are we alone in the universe and where did we come from in the first place? But I think it's it's a little unfortunate that I think in recent years, some of the narrative around space has soured quite a bit because there's a lot of it wrapped up around the idea of space billionaires and like, you know, rich people going on joy rides into space. And I... I want people to be able to separate those two things. Like going to space is really cool and rockets are really cool and lowering the access or the cost of access to space is really cool and really important so that more people can get involved in space exploration in terms of different universities, different nations, all of that kind of stuff. Um, So I would hope that we can still love space, even if people have really strong opinions about billionaires that might be involved with space because it's... They're related, but there's two separate things happening there at the end of the day. Um, And I don't want that to ruin people's idea of space exploration. Like it's definitely something we should still do. And there's a lot of purity around that. And if you talk to most people that are involved in space in some way, they be they a researcher or somebody working at a company or somebody working for the government, a lot of the attitude is just pure excitement and wonder and enthusiasm about genuinely wanting to investigate the universe around us and wanting to help plan for the future of humanity. And so it's, I want that to be conveyed really well to people too, so they understand that the people behind all this stuff in space, like we're all humans, we're just like you, and we, we really want to make the world a better place and help people feel inspired and curious to ask questions about the world around them. It's such a beautiful thing to be joyous in life and have wonder. And like, I think it's, it's some, it's like, yeah, like that, it's the reason why I'm here. I'll say the other reason why I'm doing kind of this sort of stuff is to kind of get into questions that I have um, about stuff. Um, so I've just read the three body problem um, and I'm just amazed at orbital dynamics. I didn't even know this thing. I knew that we went around stuff, but like I started to get into a little bit of orbital that dynamics and like, like vectors and all of that sort of stuff. It's just amazing. It's amazing that like that's how the universe works. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about like a bit of a primer for people who don't really know much about orbital dynamics, like what it is and and how cool it is? Oh man, I think it's it's such a beautiful mathematical construct. And if you've ever, if you've never seen like an orbital diagram of like the trajectory of something flying to the moon or flying to Mars, Google it right now. You've obviously seen this, it sounds like, but for anybody listening, um, it's it's wonderful. You're basically using math to figure out, okay, where are these two bodies going to be in space relative to one another? And what path can I take to get from point A to point B? But I can't go in a straight line because you have gravity interacting on you from your starting point, your ending point, the sun. And so you have to take all those things into account. And so sometimes you end up with just like, 
you know, sort of a semicircle that goes from one place to another. Um, for some of the Apollo missions that orbited the moon and came back to Earth, they went in this beautiful figure eight fashion because that was the most efficient way to do it. Um, and the fact that we were able to make calculations for these things on the ground here on Earth and they worked, it, like in a lot of cases, the very first time we tried to do this, it shows you just how wonderful engineering and math are. And it proves that all of these planets are round, <laughs> not flat, because the math wouldn't work if, if this wasn't the case. Um, yeah, it's it fascinates me. I, I just, I really love it. Could you kind of talk about how gravity actually works? And like maybe for a um, sort of maybe a, like a first year university kind of explainer on, on gravity. So I think the visualization that they use in a lot of physics classes works really well here. If you think of like a rubber sheet that you have different balls on to, to simulate the planets. The bigger the planet is, the more it's going to deform that sheet. And so you can think of the sheet as like the background level of the universe. And so as you move closer and closer on this sheet toward any of these spheres of mass, you get kind of pulled into where it is. And so uh, the bigger something is, the bigger its gravitational pull. But this is also how stuff gets trapped in the orbits of these things. Uh, like if you've ever been to a, a science museum where you have little thing where you can throw coins and they spiral around until they go in the hole. It's kind of like that, except hopefully you don't end up falling into the hole, which would mean crashing into whatever body you're trying to go into orbit around. But you hit that perfect speed and you can just maintain a little orbit around the thing that has the gravitational pull without actually getting sucked into it entirely. In terms of, like if we get into sort of the, the, the main kind of body of, of questions, uh, what do you think humanity looks like in a thousand years? I would hope in a thousand years that we are definitely a multi-planetary species. So we've got people living on the moon, we've got people living on Mars, maybe even some of the other planets and moons in our solar system. Uh, I would hope maybe calling on that Star Trek influence in my life that we've moved to a place where you know we can act kind of in the best interest of humanity and all work together. Uh, and understand that anywhere we are in the universe, like our life is really precious and the resources that we have to survive are incredibly limited. And so we need to take care of each other and we need to take care of the places that are sustaining us in whatever way we can so that we can thrive as a species and be happy and healthy and continue to explore the universe and ask those questions about where we came from. Maybe in a thousand years, we will have answered some of those questions. Like maybe we will have found alien life by then. I, I certainly hope we would have found alien life by then. Uh, I guess we'll find out. That was my next question. Do you think we are alone in the universe? Definitely not. I, I think there's life out there somewhere. Is there other life in our solar system? I hope so. I, I think it's probably less likely since we haven't found any of it yet, but maybe we just haven't looked in the right places or we haven't been able to reach the right places. Like the oceans of Europa and Enceladus or somewhere very deep inside Mars where maybe there's a little bit of heat that's still managing to sustain some microbes here and there. Um, but I I would hope that someday we can make contact with, you know, aliens that we could talk to, something a little bit more exciting than just a bacteria that we find surviving in the atmosphere of, of uh, Venus or something like that. Sure, sure. Like on communication, do you think, I mean, I don't know if you've thought much about sort of what universal communication could look like? I've, I've thought about that a lot and I don't have a lot of confidence that it would work just because we have a lot of intelligent species on our own planet that we're not capable of communicating with. Like we don't really know how to talk to dolphins or octopi or uh, whales, you know, we, and we kind of listen in on their conversations uh, and to see if we can figure out what's going on. But we can't actively communicate with them. And that's some, but something from a place where we have some common frame of reference in terms of other things around us, like the oceans or other animals that they might be able to refer to. So I think that's actually going to be that first step of cracking that code. Can we get to a point where we can communicate with other intelligent species in our own planet? And then can we use that to learn something about how to communicate with another one? Um, Maybe if you have something that is intelligent in the same ways that we are intelligent, you know, they've created computers, they understand machine learning, maybe there's some way to use that to kind of 
analyze a lexicon of their language and create the universal translators of Star Trek, which would be fantastic. But at, at least any time in the near future, it doesn't seem like that's very realistic. In terms of the golden record, like, what do you know about the golden record? When did you find out about it? I think I've known about it since I was a kid, actually, from the National Geographic magazines that my grandfather would give me, because I specifically remember the issues from when um, Voyager flew past Sat or um, sorry, not Saturn, Neptune, because that was when I was old enough to remember that it was happening. Which again blows my mind. It's like we hadn't even been to Uranus and Neptune until after I was born, and I don't feel like I'm that old. Um, but uh, we actually bought. There was a Kickstarter a few years ago where you could get replicas of the Golden Record, and so we we backed the Kickstarter and we took the records. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we brought them with a record player, like a that one of my friends had converted into being battery powered with this big battery pack and we took it to the park in phoenix and we just played the golden record like sitting in the park chatting about it and uh, i'd never actually listened to it before so that was an interesting experience to see okay so a, a group of scientists in the 1970s like this is what they thought represented humanity and it makes me wonder you know how would it be different if you gave that assignment to different groups of people what would they select to represent us because it's it's really hard in the span of a couple of records how do you encapsulate an entire species or an entire planet not just in not just a single species yeah absolutely um i mean you must have amazingly cool friends that are tying batteries to record players uh it's a <laughs> it's a fun that's a fun pastime um i mean i think yeah what do you what do you think would be important when putting together a, a new golden record i think making sure that there's a really broad swath of representation in terms of geography and cultures and trying to convey the best of what we want to show as a species. I mean, we're already kind of now blasting out lots of radio waves of things that we've created that are not necessarily all good. I mean, if aliens are able to pick up on that stuff, they can watch the news, they can see what's been going on the last half century or so across the world, which isn't great. Um, but yeah, this is where I think it's really important to start consulting, you know, artists and getting some emotion in there because it's you don't want it to just be this clinical representation of what humans are. And I think Carl Sagan and and the folks that worked on the Golden Record did a really good job with that in terms of, you know, there's there's stuff in there like music, for example, and greetings. And so um, it it wasn't just this very scientific like here's a package of what we think represents humans. Um, but I I can only analyze it from the standpoint of like my own background. And so it would be interesting to see what like non-scientists think or people from other backgrounds and see like what, what they would have selected. Um, and maybe it's something that's worth just kind of posing as a, a bigger question to society. Like, what do you think represents the best of humanity? Sure, sure. Um, what would you like to know? And I, I have to sort of like put the context into the question in the sense of like, this is a intelligent um, extraterrestrial species that's like maybe a million years more advanced than we are currently. How did you manage to not annihilate yourselves in a million years? <laughs> so I would hope if you had a species that managed to last that long, you've cracked a lot of secrets in terms of, uh, you know, getting along with each other, understanding how to survive as a species, um, you know, being adapted to the planet that you're on and any hardships that might come your way, like asteroid impacts or disease and things like that. Um, you know, is there something we could learn from that? Because humans have only been around for a few tens of thousands of years at this point. We're pretty young in the history of our own planet and the universe as a whole. So there, there's stuff that's lasted a lot longer than we have on this planet and is long gone at this point. Um, so yeah, being able to last for a million years is a big feat. How do you think that like us finding other intelligent life would change the way we think about ourselves on Earth? I think it will help put us in the context of the universe as a whole. And I like that you specified intelligent life because usually the question is, you know, if we found life somewhere else, how would that impact us? And I would, maybe in the mid-90s, I would have said, oh, life 
in any form would greatly transform the way that humans view themselves and the universe, um, which was maybe we got some inklings of what that could be from the uh, the Allen Hills meteorite that they found in Antarctica, which they thought maybe there were microfossils in there from Mars and then some reanalysis found out that's not what it was. But this was on like front page of the newspapers at the time. You know, President Clinton gave a speech about it. It was a really big deal. But I feel like in society today, the attention spans are so short and people are so, it's weird to say skeptical because people are like skeptical, but accepting of weird information at the same time. I think that if there was an announcement of microbial life found on Mars and they just released a photo of some unrecognizable looking bacteria, that people actually wouldn't care all that much. It would be a blip in science news and then the next week people would move on. But if you had, you know, intelligent species that we could communicate with that was recognizable, you know, you could tell that it was some kind of thing that is alive and doesn't be, it's like not interpreted by your brain as like a dog or some lesser form of life. I think that would really have a shift. And I think it would be kind of that first contact type moment, like in Star Trek, where it's like, oh, we're not alone. We really should like get our act together <laughs> in the solar system and, and on this planet and figure out like, how do we go and find more of these species and, and continue the exploration that, that shows that we're not alone. Sure, sure. Um, biosignatures or technosignatures? What do you think is the more likely of the, of, of what we'll find? I would say I would probably lean toward techno signatures because we're able to actively look for that at a much broader scale than biosignatures. Like the biosignatures, we kind of have to be on the ground in places like with, with the Mars rovers or looking at the atmospheres of individual exoplanets, and that can be tricky. Um, but if we're just looking for things like radio signals and the kind of stuff that the SETI project is looking for, that we can kind of scan the whole sky. And so if those signatures are out there, I think we'll find those first. What is your favorite thing about Mars? I think just the fact that it's a lot more active than people realize. Like I think people think about Mars and they imagine it's just this cold red rock floating out in space, but it has, you know, active dust storms. It has little dust devils, which kind of like tiny tornadoes that go across the surface. The polar caps grow and shrink with the seasons. Uh, we see new impact craters forming all the time. So stuff smashing into the surface from space. We have landslides that we've seen forming on, on Mars today. Uh, the south polar cap of Mars has this texture that we call Swiss cheese terrain and like that terrain is changing over time. So just the fact that it it's very dynamic, I think is really interesting. And it kind of emphasizes that Earth is not the only place in the solar system where stuff is happening. There's things happening everywhere. We just don't get to see it all the time. But now we have so many missions that are on Mars or orbiting Mars that we actually have a, a an evolving view of how much the planet changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Cool. Um, could you tell us a little bit about well, the difficulties with flying a drone helicopter on Mars and why that is so amazing that we were able to do that? So the biggest thing is that the atmosphere on Mars is really, really thin. It's nothing like what you would think if you pay attention to movies like The Martian, where you know, you've know you got dust storms so strong that it's blowing over a spacecraft big enough to carry multiple humans. It It's so thin, it doesn't have enough oomph behind it to do any of that. It's basically thin enough to kind of have dust hang in the air like a snow globe. I usually have a snow globe that I demo this with, but unfortunately, the last time I shook it up, the, the Mars ball inside of it, like, detached from the inside of the thing so that just floats around um but it means that uh there's there's not necessarily enough of an atmosphere we didn't think there was enough of an atmosphere for anything to really fly unless it had some massive wingspan and that's really tricky to do because you can only send things of a certain size it's got to fit inside your little payload fairing which is essentially a tiny little package that like everything fits inside of. So you have a little capsule like this and then inside of it you have like the tiny little thing you're trying to send to Mars. Yes, um, so it doesn't fit in here. <laughs> <laughs> I have like all of the different missions. So I've got like, this is Pathfinder in its capsule. This is Sojourner. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> this is Pathfinder with Sojourner for scale. So that's Sojourner right there. And then 
you call this like perseverance. It's meant to be curiosity was perseverance or curiosity. Very cute. Pretty similar. You gotta have props. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I need a little ingenuity now for for the helicopter question. So I would think that um, really the development of drones to fly on Mars benefited from the the huge developments in drone technology here on Earth in terms of making smaller, lighter batteries, making drones that could fly that you know didn't require uh, they could fly farther on less battery power, so that helped them shrink over time. And even the camera that's on board the helicopter is a commercial off the shelf camera. It's not something that was specifically designed, which is for space. So it brought the cost way down. Um, so they ended up doing a, a lot of tests to say how small and light can we make the actual drone part separate from the wings so that we can build a wingspan small enough that we could mount it on a rover to hitch a ride to bars. And so uh, the wingspan is like, forget what the exact measurement is a couple meters somewhere around there and then the whole spacecraft itself only weighs about a couple of kilograms so it's very small it's very light uh and not only did it manage to fly but it's flown like 20 plus flights at this point which is really amazing for something that we weren't even sure was necessarily going to work in the first place so you don't only have the thin atmosphere you also have the issue of uh we have an idea of the broad scale weather patterns on mars but if any of you have tried to fly like a DJI drone, like a one gust of wind and it can just take it into the side of a building or <laughs> into the ocean or something like that. So what if there's some tiny gust of wind and it just like blows the drone way off course? Um, so we've been really lucky from from that standpoint that the drone has been able to fly. But uh, I shouldn't say lucky. We are we are blessed to have such talented engineers that designed a thing that could fly on Mars at all. So hats off to those guys. In terms of like powering uh, rovers and drones, um, their solar power, um, you know, w w how do that? How does that sort of decision making process go? If it's going to be solar, if it's going to be nuclear, like what 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 sort of gets taken into account uh, with that sort of stuff? Maybe with all spacecraft, essentially. So there's usually three things that are the the main factors that decide what you're going to do there. One is cost. So solar panels are cheaper than nuclear batteries because buying plutonium-232 is really pricey. And that's what we use for um, powering spacecraft. Um, another is just sunlight availability. So if you're sending missions that are going like Voyager, you know, out of the solar system, you wouldn't be able to get enough power from solar panels once you get past a about Saturn. Like then you really need some kind of nuclear battery to keep it going. And we've been lucky there because if we didn't have that on something like the Voyagers, we wouldn't be getting data back from outside the solar system. And we still get tiny amounts of data back from Voyager, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the size and the like the mass of the spacecraft itself. So Curiosity and Perseverance, which are both about the size of like a, a Mini Cooper car, uh, they are right on that cusp of they could have been solar powered like the previous rovers, but it would have been more convenient from like a size standpoint to have them nuclear powered. Uh, they made some designs where they had solar panels and they look kind of ridiculous because they look, they've got giant wings and like not in a cute way. <laughs> um, so eventually they managed to make the budget such that they could get, you know, like, okay, we're gonna go with the nuclear battery option. So the upside there is we have like less mass on the rover. It uh, is not impacted by dust storms, which is what killed off one of the previous rovers opportunity. Um, but on the, the downside, you know that that battery is going to run out at some point. So we, we know the half-life of, of the power source. Luckily, that will probably last a lot longer than any of the equipment, like the drivetrain and stuff on the rover itself. But uh, we don't have the, the option or the, the luck that we had with some of the previous Mars missions where like Spirit and Opportunity lasted or an order of magnitude longer than they were supposed to because wind kept coming and clearing off the solar panels for us year after year uh, until the dust storm that killed Opportunity. So they could have theoretically lasted indefinitely until you know some massive mechanical failure killed off the rovers. Whereas I think the the power source for Curiosity runs out in like the mid twenty thirties or something like that. In terms of like the drivetrain, is it like is it one single drivetrain driving the four wheel? How, how many wheels is on 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 each of the rovers? 
So they usually have six. This is where my handy diagram comes in. So you have three on each side. And um, it's a system called a rocker bogey, um, where like you've got a, a couple of wheels that kind of act like this. So the front wheel and the middle wheel will control in one direction. And then the back wheels are kind of like on their own thing. So this is actually really convenient because you can sort of operate them all separately. Uh, they can turn, um, you can drive over things in a way that you wouldn't necessarily be able to if you only had four wheels and they can go in any direction. So that's convenient when we've had issues like uh, both Spirit and Opportunity had wheels that malfunctioned at some point because the rovers kind of age the same way that humans do. So like their joints will start to go and their memories start to go. Um, and so with Spirit, one of the wheels got stuck and we actually ended up driving the rover backwards for quite a while because it was just the best way for the wheels to run. Um, opportunity at some point near the end was stuck with like one wheel kind of not touching the ground a little bit. So it was like, like canted slightly. Um, if you, you can kind of think about it that way. So having that many wheels gives you a little bit of redundancy. So you could probably have like at least two wheels fail and everything will work. Uh, more than that, you might start to run into some, some trickiness of trying to drive. Uh, and eventually like the spirit rover got stuck at some point and was never able to drive again. So we just turned it into a stationary lander and said, well, we'll do science from this one spot uh, until the rover dies. And it made it till the next winter, essentially, um, until the, the batteries died and we lost the rover. Cool. Uh, what are they mostly made of, like in terms of materials? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not actually sure. I know like for Curiosity, for example, the wheels are made out of aluminum. Um, that's about the thickness of a pop can. We discovered that that is not a great material for driving on Mars when you're in a place where there's a lot of rocks. So uh, it poked a bunch of holes in the wheels and we upgraded them to titanium with Perseverance. And from what I've seen so far, the, the wheels on Perseverance have been holding up, but we haven't really hit any super rough terrain yet. So that'll be interesting to see how that works. Um, but other than that, I'm not really sure what like the main the main metals would that you would list off are for like the construction of the rovers. Sure. Uh, for all of our non-American guests, it's aluminium um, that she was interested. In. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think al aluminium is is generally. I I think there's there's many countries in the world that would 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 use that. Um, there's like also a lot of origami I see, which is kind of cool. That like you have a lot of things in space that fold out or that become. Like I just, I love the the James Webb telescope, just this like idea of like, it kind of like fitting into itself and becoming this this thing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about maybe even James Webb? Um, yeah, so the origami kind of ties into needing to fit into those little packages. So you not only have, the, if you're sending a mission to another planet and you've got like the thing that's taking it to the other planet that it needs to fit inside, but all of this also needs to fit inside what's called a payload fairing on a rocket. And the biggest one we have right now, like on the whole planet, I think is something like seven meters. So anything you make has to fold up to that size. Uh, you say it's beautiful. I think a lot of engineers would actually curse it because they're like, oh, and now we have to have all these moving parts. And James Webb Space Telescope was actually like really stressful in this regard because it's absolutely massive. So they had to fold it up to fit into one of these fairings. And then there was something like 300 plus individual deployments that had to happen where something had to unfold and then like you know get deployed like like a like a boom arm going out and then all these pieces folding out from each other and if any one of them failed it it wouldn't work properly and we've had this happen with missions before um the high gain antenna on the galileo mission going to jupiter failed to deploy properly and so we only got back like one tenth of the data that the mission should have been able to take because the antenna was like kind of crunched up and so it wasn't able to transmit the radio signals very well. Um, but JWS, JWST is like the super improvement over the Hubble Space Telescope. We're going to be able to peer back, you know, 14 billion years into the history of the universe. We're going to be able to see some of the earliest galaxies, maybe even see parts of the universe that existed before galaxies could form. Um, so it'll really, really help answer those questions like how did the universe evolve? and it seems like all the deployments have gone well. They just released some more of the calibration images in the last few days. So it looks like the optics are working well. Um, so I think it's going to be really revolutionary. And I'm, I'm really hoping that there are some kids out there that see the pictures that come back from GWST 
uh, like on the covers of things like Sky and Telescope that impact them in the same way that seeing things like the Hubble Pillars of Creation image on the cover of Sky and Telescope impacted me. So I remember seeing that issue in particular and being like, holy cow, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And I like taped it to my bedroom, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think from an engineering perspective, I think there's such, there's such beauty in engineering. Um, and like, I think it makes it from a from a spectator perspective, it makes it like like that much more beautiful, and I'm sure it must make it a real pain uh, when it comes to like the actual designing. Um, could you talk a bit about the um, Zeb? Uh, sorry, Z Factor Fellowship. So Z Factor Fellowship is a program to connect students from historically excluded backgrounds in the aerospace industry with um, internship opportunities at different aerospace companies. And then also uh, give them funding and training to run community outreach projects. And they get to define their community in whatever they, way they want. They, that could mean their school. It might mean their local the town that they live in. Um, if it's a student from like, you know, LGBTQ community, maybe you want to reach out online to that community at large, like, or something local to you. Um, so we really wanted to leave it kind of free form for the students to define what that meant to them. And the goal behind that aspect of the fellowship was really important because uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there to give people um, internships at different aerospace companies, but I felt like it wasn't enough to just give one student an opportunity or a handful of students an opportunity each year. I wanted to empower them to be able to go back and talk to their communities and say, hey, look, this is a career path that you can follow. I did it and you can do it too. There are jobs here if it's something that you're interested in because a lot of people don't realize there are any options for working in space if it's something that you like other than being an astronaut. And I know when I was a kid, I was kind of discouraged from pursuing space as like a, a passion or a career because I knew I was never going to be an astronaut. Like I have a physical disability. I would never make it through the, the medical tests. Um, and so my parents were kind of encouraging me to do something more practical. And I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do space. I'm going to work on Mars rovers. That's not being an astronaut. And so I want to kind of show what the opportunities are there. And so, um, I ended up partnering with three other colleagues in the space industry who had similar motivations of wanting to provide opportunities for students that might not have connections to find those internships. Um, and we actually just in the last week or two announced our second class of fellows ever. So last year was the inaugural year and this year's year two. And it's been amazing, just the reception up from companies, the impact that's had on the students and the feedback that we're getting from them. Um, it's It's been really incredible. It's such a rewarding experience. Amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if we talk about sort of um, inclusion, you know, I think historically, I think obviously in the, historically in the world and especially sort of in the context of the gold record, like in the late seventies, you know, even women in the workplace wasn't a, wasn't as a common thing as it is now. Like, have you been able to see sort of a transformation or a, a movement of that needle in any way? Definitely. I remember the very first space conference I went to was in 2007. Um, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which is like the biggest gathering of space scientists each year. And I, it was very noticeable, like being a young woman kind of looking around the crowd. It was like, oh, this is mostly old white men. And it, it felt awkward. And I've seen the shift since then, like until now, there's a huge, there, there's still like heavily uh, a bias toward older men if you look at like one end of the attendance. But then if you look at everybody kind of under the age of, I'd say 35-ish, that is way more representative of the world as a whole. You're seeing tons of diversity in that side. And so you can see that the tides are changing and more people from different backgrounds are coming in. Um, there's still, we're not at parity yet in terms of like representation of women. I, I know for the Mars program in particular, it's about 27% women. Um, so a little bit little bit of a ways to go there, but much better than it used to be. Um, and we're surely not anywhere near parity when you start looking at like, you know, breakdown of, um, you know, inclusion of people of color in STEM. So we have a long way to go there. But when I go to these events, I see more and more people showing up that are from diverse backgrounds. And so the, the efforts of trying to get more people involved are working. 
The key is also, though, we can't just bring them in. We have to create an environment in the space uh, sector as a whole where people want to stay. And that has been tricky because you do have some toxic attitudes from some some of the old guard, I would say, uh, and that can drive people out. And so we have to figure out how to like stop that from happening so that people come in and then they stay and they want to encourage the next generation of people to come in because they've had a great experience and they want someone else to follow in their footsteps. What do you think, what do you think kind of needs to happen or, or, or where do you think those things can come from in terms of, of, of speeding that up and, and, and improving that? I think just first off, just increasing the number of people that you're getting from different backgrounds coming in to kind of demonstrate like, hey, there's a lot of talent that has been like actively excluded from coming into this field and that's detrimental to the field as a whole. Um, And that's actually been something that we've seen enormously through just the applications that we've gotten through the Z Factor Fellowship because we thought in the first year since we hadn't we didn't have a ton of time to promote it. We were a brand new program. We thought we'd be lucky if we got maybe 20 applications. We got 200 in the span of a couple of weeks. And there weren't very many that were just an easy, oh, no, you know, this, this is definitely not someone we would accept. Every single student that applied was fantastic in some way or another. And it was so difficult to narrow it down. And really the only limitation was the number of slots we had at companies that we could place students with. It was not the lack of talent on the other side. So just kind of, you know, proving that the talent is there if you let them in, which I feel like you shouldn't have to do that. You should want to let people in. (laughs) Um, But I I think it will help that attitude. And certainly um, I, I think that is changing, which is really great. Some of the other attitudes though, I think, you know, it's not just a, it's not just the aerospace industry, it's kind of societal systemic stuff, you know, in terms of sexism and racism. And I don't know how we tackle all of those things other than seeing that that has been changing and, and moving mostly in a positive trajectory over time. Um, I say mostly because right now things in the United States don't seem great in in that regard, uh, but I, I'm hoping that it will change in the near future. Um, <laughs> And in other places, I, I see like you know a lot of positive momentum there. So I think society as a whole will have to change a little bit more before we we see this like permeate into all the industries where this is also like a specific problem. Space Twitter, like I was, I I found Space Twitter when I started the project five months ago. Uh, it's it's awesome. Like it's diverse. It is like empowered. Uh, a lot of LGBTQ. Uh, there's just a lot of very cool, funky people working in space, and I think I think that that like space community has is is quite amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe you could talk a bit about it because you're one of those cool people that are in that space. Twitter. That's how I found. That's how I found you as well. So, I think space Twitter is fantastic, and when you see people kind of complaining about you know, Twitter's a dumpster fire and stuff like that. I was like, you guys are on the wrong side of Twitter. You got to come over to space Twitter. It's all amazing pictures of galaxies and rovers and people just getting excited about launches and stuff like that. It's, it's such a supportive environment. And I, the thing that I love is that Twitter is basically democratizing access to science by giving both scientists and people that are not scientists an opportunity to have a dialogue over science. And so people that have never had the opportunity to ask a scientist, you know, some really simple questions like how do tides work? I've gotten that one once all the way up to, you know, what are your thoughts on like how this hyper specific thing about terraforming Mars might work? And I I love being able to have that dialogue with people and just see the, the curiosity there and like, you know, encourage them to ask more questions. Um, and I, I like that Twitter gives them an avenue to do that. And so I I would hope that, I don't know if that environment exists in like other sections of Twitter because I'm very kind of like isolated in the space part of Twitter. Um, but I think because it is full of these cool people that are generally quite approachable and enthusiastic and diverse, uh, I want the general public to see that like, 
this is really what science is and who these people are. It's not a bunch of old white men in lab coats anymore. It's like somebody that you would go and get a drink with or like people that you might go party with and like they just do this as a job or they do it because they're massive nerds and it's the thing that they love. Um, and I want us to all be like approachable and, and nerd out about space together. So yeah, tell your friends to join space Twitter. <laughs> tiny, tiny. Um, generally my favorite question, uh, in the last year, what have you found most fascinating? That's hard. I feel like in the last year, I, I I feel very disconnected from things that are happening on Mars lately since my day job has taken me to Earth. And so uh, feeling that like one step removed is slightly uh, disappointing at times. I, I miss working on active missions. That's certainly an amazing thing to be able to say, like, I work on the Mars rover. Um, I don't get to say that anymore. <laughs> but I think... Uh, yeah. It's it might be boring because we already talked about it, but I think just watching the success of Ingenuity and also seeing how much the Ingenuity helicopter has resonated with the public. Like I did not think that people outside of space people would care about the helicopter very much. And it, it doesn't really have much in, in the way of capabilities. It can fly and it could take some, you know, okay pictures. Uh, but like the public went crazy for it. I wrote a Medium article about the helicopter and it surpassed like in terms of reads and clicks and stuff. It surpassed by thousands, like any other article I'd ever written. And I was like, wow, really? The helicopter? Like, I didn't know people cared about it that much. Um, so I'm glad that like it became a vehicle for enthusiasm for space for like maybe a whole new segment of people that weren't really paying attention before and i feel like every time it flies it's like you know you want to make a check mark somewhere and just be like okay how many more flights does this thing have in it before we have to say goodbye because you never want to say goodbye to a mission but you know it's going to happen at some point um so it's kind of turned into like this opportunity-esque thing in that you're like how much longer is it gonna go um so i'm really I, i've just been really excited to watch the the progression of the helicopter and like the increase in its capabilities with each flight very cool um, any advice to young aspiring scientists? There are a lot of opportunities in science and in space. And so you just have to kind of seek them out and figure out maybe what area interests you the most. But the most important thing on top of all of it is just to stay curious, keep asking questions. And through there, I think you'll find the thing that really aligns with what you want to do and the path that will take you to that end point so that you can pursue the part of science that maybe you want to do as a career. Tanya, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs>